Peter King. That's for Toshak. Toshak! Cardiff City Football Club were originally formed in 1899 as a way to enable the members of the Riverside Amateur Cricket Club to stay together throughout the winter months. Bartley Wilson, a lithographic artist originally from Bristol, arranged a meeting at his home to see who was interested. Only five people turned up, and that could have marked the end of the idea. However, a second meeting was arranged with more positive results, and the Riverside Football Club was launched, later to be named Riverside AFC after an amalgamation with rival club Riverside Albion. Early matches were played in Sapphire Gardens, with the team colours being chocolate and amber quartered shirts and black shorts. Following a few local friendlies in the winter of 1899-1900, including a 9-1 thrashing by Barry West End in their first fixture, the club was accepted into the Cardiff and District League. In October 1905, Cardiff was made a city, and following this, Riverside AFC applied for election to the South Wales League. They were accepted, and in 1908, changed their name to Cardiff City Football Club. They needed a more permanent home, and they were offered an area of waste ground which had previously been used for refuse between Sloper Road and the railway sidings. A seven-year lease was agreed at £90 per annum, and this committed the club to professionalism, and in 1910 they were admitted into the second division of the Southern League. Financial support was offered at a crucial time by Lord Ninian Crichton Stewart, and in gratitude the club were unanimous in their decision to call their new home Ninian Park. The 1st of September 1910 saw league champions Aston Villa send a strong reserve side to play a prestigious friendly to open the new ground with the official kickoff performed by Lord Ninian. Villa won 2-1, watched by a crowd of 7,000. Jack Evans scoring the city's first goal at Ninian Park. They were wearing their new colours, blue shirts and stockings and white shorts, which would later earn them the nickname the Bluebirds. Throughout that inaugural season, the players had to report early in the morning before each home game to assist with the removal of broken glass, shale and other small items of rubbish that had worked their way to the playing surface. Quite often during matches, players wore knee and elbow pads to avoid cuts and grazes. The following season, Cardiff won the Welsh Cup for the first time, and in only their third season they became champions and gained promotion to the Southern League Division I. Following a break for the war, the club resumed in the Southern League and in 1920 were accepted into the second division of the Football League. In their very first league season, 1920-21, promotion was gained to the first division. They missed out on the second division championship to Birmingham City on goal average. And in the FA Cup, a record 50,000 people thronged to Ninian Park for a quarter-final clash with Chelsea. City won by one goal to nil. Arthur Cashmore, the scorer, in a game described as one of the most exciting ever seen at Ninian Park. Cardiff went on to lose in the semi-final to Wolves. The Bluebirds finished in a creditable fourth position at the end of their first season in Division I, and in City's last game of the season, Tom Farquharson made his debut in goal against Manchester United. The Irish international is considered to be the greatest of all the Cardiff City goalkeepers and went on to play on the side which lost the league championship on goal average to Huddersfield in 1924 and in both City's FA Cup final teams. On the 25th of April 1925, Cardiff City were at Wembley for the FA Cup final. Their opponents were Sheffield United. 
A tragic mistake by Harry Wake in the 32nd minute cost them the cup. He was caught in possession by Fred Sunstall, allowing the England international to go on to beat Farkasson. They were beaten by just one goal, and following the match, apologies were made for the Bluebirds' poor performance. The club vowed to return to Wembley to lift the trophy. Their supporters had only two years to wait until this prophecy was fulfilled. The road to Wembley began with a third-round victory over Aston Villa, who were beaten 2-1, City captained that day by their famous halfback Billy Hardy. Darlington and Bolton were quick to follow, both being dismissed by two goals without reply, and in the sixth round against Chelsea, the game was decided in City's favour in a replay by a late penalty. Cardiff now had the twin towers of Wembley firmly in their sights, and in the semi-final against Reading, Harry Wake redeemed himself for his blunder in the 1925 final by scoring and helping Cardiff to the FA Cup final for the second time. With their cup final place assured, training had an excited atmosphere about it. The 23rd of April 1927 remains the greatest day in the history of Cardiff City. For on that St George's Day, the FA Cup was taken out of England for the only time so far in its history. Arsenal, their opponents, were finally beaten when 16 minutes from time, the legendary Huey Ferguson scored the only goal of the match. Much has been spoken and written about the goal which won Cardiff the Cup. Did Lewis, Arsenal's Welsh goalkeeper, deliberately concede the goal? Did Greece on his jersey cause him to mishandle? And who did get the final touch? The goal was officially credited to Huey Ferguson, and that's how it remains in the record books. But photographic evidence shows conclusively that it was Lewis's elbow which finally pushed the ball over the line. It had been an incredible achievement, with the Bluebirds completing a unique double, winning both the FA and the Welsh Cup. On returning to the Welsh capital, the team were treated to a tremendous reception. The achievement had been a remarkable one for a team with only seven years' experience in the Football League. Following such early promise, Cardiff began to falter, and just four years on from their FA Cup triumph, they found themselves in the third division. One reason for the slump was the loss of Huey Ferguson, Cardiff's FA Cup goal scorer. Ferguson was brought from Motherwell for £5,000, a staggering sum in 1925, although he more than repaid the fee by scoring a record 76 goals in 117 appearances for City, 10 FA Cup goals in 13 appearances, and five Welsh Cup goals in eight games. Following a transfer to Dundee in 1929, Ferguson began to suffer from depression and was to take his own life a year later. Another key player to leave at this critical time was Fred Keener, believed by many to be Cardiff's greatest player. Keener joined as an amateur in 1911 and went on to play 61 games in the Southern League, interrupted by the First World War during which he was wounded twice, 369 league, 42 FA Cup and 32 Welsh Cup appearances brought this tremendous total to 504. Capped for Wales on 31 occasions, he was team captain of the 1927 FA Cup winning team. An impressive record and eventually a sad loss to the club. Things went from bad to worse when, at the end of the 1932-33 season, the club narrowly missed having to apply for re-election, prompting manager Fred Stewart to resign after 22 years of service. Stewart proved to be the most successful of all the Cardiff City managers. Club founder Bartley Wilson took over the temporary position of manager before handing over to Welsh FA councillor Ben Watts-Jones during the worst season in the club's history, finishing in 22nd position in 1933-34 and needing to be re-elected to the 3rd Division South. City's poor form continued throughout the immediate post-war decade, the highest position in those 10 years being 9th in the 3rd Division South. With full-time football beginning again in 1946 after careful team building throughout the war years, Cardiff shook off their poor pre-war performances and immediately gained promotion to the second division. Billy McCandless took over from Cyril Spears, who had been with the club throughout the war years, although the change was only temporary, with Spears returning from Norwich in 1947. In the minds of many older supporters, the 46-47 Bluebirds team was the best ever. And with a team recruited mainly from local talent, the statistics are impressive. Between September 1946 and March 1947, City had an unbeaten run of 21 games, of which 19 were victories. 
Centre forward Stan Richards made a club record by scoring 30 league goals in 34 matches. Cardiff went up as champions and heralded the start of some of the Bluebirds' most successful years. After narrowly missing promotion on three occasions, Cardiff finally brought First Division football back to Ninian Park in the 1951-52 season, after an absence of 23 years. Promotion, however, was not assured until the final game of the season against Leeds United. The game, played on the same day as the FA Cup final, was watched by over 52,000 rain-drenched supporters and proved to be one of the great days in the club's history. We had one game left against Leeds United here, uh, the first Saturday in May. And that week in Cardiff, you couldn't go out unless somebody was talking to you all the time about this game. The tension built throughout the week. And I remember here, when the game started, there were 52,000 people here. Tremendous excitement. And we won the match fairly comfortably, really. I remember the Leeds, one or two of the Leeds players were saying, go on, we're not going to kick you today because we'd like you to win and get promotion. Um, so when Wilf Grant scored after about 28 minutes, I think, it settled us. And from that moment on, he got another, then Chisholm got a goal. And the fact they scored, I think, two minutes from the end didn't make any difference. When the final whistle went, we'd won 3-1, the crowd spilled onto the pitch. You couldn't see a blade of grass from the director's box where, of course, we were all gathered to acknowledge the, the plaudits of the crowd. It was a great day. It was one of the greatest days, I'm sure, in Cardiff's history uh, because we hadn't been in the first division since the 20s. In the last game of the season, which I'll never forget at all, uh, when we played Leeds and we won the match 3-1. And I was very fortunate to uh, score two goals in that game. I don't think I'll ever forget that, Cliff. Ever. For reasons that have never been made public, manager Cyril Spears tended his resignation at the end of the 53-54 season. 1954 also proved to be a sad year with the loss of club founder Bartley Wilson, who retired at the age of 85, and the death of former manager Fred Stewart. With new secretary manager Trevor Morris filling the vacancy made by Spears, Cardiff began to flounder, narrowly missing relegation, by beating Wolves in the final match of the 1954-55 season. After two seasons of fighting off relegation, the Bluebirds finally succumbed, finishing the 1956-57 season in 21st position. Of their last 14 matches, they had won only one. Centre forward Trevor Ford played his last match for City in November 1956. The Welsh international had cost the club a record fee of £30,000 three years previously. Controversy surrounding his autobiography, I Lead the Attack, soon followed, resulting in a three-year ban. The next season saw another leading figure leave Ninian Park in the shape of Jerry Hitchens, who joined Aston Villa for £22,500. In July 1958, Trevor Morris left to join Swansea, and he was replaced by coach Bill Jones. With Cardiff struggling near the foot of the second division, Jones made one of Cardiff's finest signings by bringing Derek Tapscott from Arsenal for £10,000. I had five good years at Arsenal, scoring quite a few goals for them um, until I got injured. Then um, Cardiff City came in for me, and the manager, Bill Jones, who saw me from Barry County at the Arsenal, who I knew was a good manager, brought me back to Cardiff, and that was September 58. City's bid for promotion in the 1959-60 season attracted average crowds of 25,000 in Indian Park, and with the team on their way to attaining 90 goals in a season, it was easy to see why. Big of a Cardiff, through to Watkins. Watkins across to his opposite number, Walsh, and he's got Sullivan coming up to take this pass. And he puts it through to Tap Scott. Tap's got a lovely black flip. And here's Sullivan coming up hard. And it turned very nearly for a corner. A great shot on the run there by Sullivan. As Fisher, harassed by Moore, comes out. A good kick that. Walsh challenged by Clark. Puts it back to Milne. Quickly, they say. And up comes Milne to Tap Scott. And he very nearly gets it past Garvey, the centre half. But play on, says the referee. And here's Sullivan now. Over the halfway line. And Joe Bonson for Cardiff. Chasing it, challenged by Brian Garvey, the centre-half. Puts it across, and a good shot, and a better save. Fifteen minutes gone. 
And a nice one there. And, a, and this time it's a second goal. Scored by Bonson. Bonson's header after a free kick. Beautifully placed there by Watkins. Fifteen and a half minutes gone. And Cardiff City 2. Owl City 0. Milne comes up, still, still limping, but still with a kick as we may see now. Yes, a nice one. Hello, hello! He hit the post. Alec Milne, the injured man, hits the bar there. On April the 16th, 1960, City celebrated their 50th anniversary as a professional club. Their opponents, by coincidence, were Aston Villa. Unlike their first meeting 50 years previously, this time both teams were championship contenders. It was one of the greatest games I think I played in for Cardiff City for a long, long time, where everybody knew that a win against Villa, even though we had three or four games left, we had to win that one. Um, my old manager of Villa at the time was a friend of mine, who Joe Mercer, who broke his leg my first game at the Arsenal. So there was joy for both because Villa were top and Cardiff City was second. The winner come from Graham Moore. I think it was at the Greenstone end. Um, he hit a cracker. And that was the... We were there for promotion, even though we had three games left. After the match, there was a few drinks before we went up to the crowd. Um, in the dressing room, we went up to the, to the stand after, and the crowd was unbelievable. You couldn't see a blade of grass at Ninian Park because of the crowd on the pitch waiting for us to come up onto the stand. After spending about 45 minutes down there, um, we had a few bottles, and then we all went into town and celebrated. And I can't even watch how I got home. It was a tremendous night, and a tremendous achievement for Gareth City. Every game after, from Christmas on has been a, a real cup tie. Once we, everybody started to talk about this promotion business, it started to build up and it's built up all along. And then we struck this bad patch for a couple of games and then you don't want me to say what happened after. I think it's been a very, very hard season. Very hard indeed. After an absence of three years, Cardiff were once again playing first division football. Floodlighting was finally installed at Ninian Park with the club being one of the last to have it. The season, however, was plagued by injuries, most notably Steve Gammon, who suffered a broken leg in a home game against Manchester City. With only three wins in their last nine league games, Cardiff finished in 15th position, with Derek Tapscott their leading goal scorer with 21 league goals. The 1961-62 season got off on the wrong footing when team captain Danny Malloy left following a refusal to his request for extra money. Malloy, who had made 225 appearances, was one of the club's best signings. During the season, other club favourites were to leave. Derek Sullivan, with 276 league appearances going to Exeter City, followed by Graham Moore, for whom relegation threatened Chelsea, paid a record £35,000. With these departures, manager Bill Jones increasingly put his faith in younger players. Following a win over Sheffield Wednesday on the 11th of November, City lay in seventh position. However, of the 21 games that followed, the Bluebirds won only once. Even the signing of Mel Charles from Arsenal couldn't stop the rot. And on the 23rd of April, Cardiff played their final home match in the first division, beating West Ham United 3-0. Manager Bill Jones was dismissed from his duties in September 1962. Before departing, he'd purchased the legendary Ivor Oldchurch from Newcastle United for £18,000 and Bristol Rovers' Peter Hooper for £7,000. With this combined strike force, City were unlucky not to have returned to the First Division at the first time of asking, finishing the season in 10th position, Hooper the leading scorer with 22 goals. One of the highlights of the season was when Cardiff inflicted a 5-2 defeat of arch-rival Swansea Town on the 15th of September at Ninian Park. Old Church again looking for the space, and there goes the ball straight into it to Milne. Milne making ground. Good one, too. And then Milne tries there! A beautiful goal there by Mel Charles. A lovely pass by Alec Milne. And it's Cardiff City 2. Cardiff City 2. Swansea Town 0. After 10 minutes, what a start to this attractive game. It's Peter Davies now for Swansea. 
out to Barry Jones at outside right. Showing it to Stinful and going past him. He crosses. And it's all oh, a fine save there by Dylan and Johnny. Still coming through. And it's a goal. It's a goal. It's a goal. There's Cobb for Swansea by Herbie Williams. After 16 minutes play. And so it's now Cardiff City 2, Swansea Town 1. And Cardiff to kick off then. Leading by two goals to one after just 16 minutes play in this thing. First half. Cleared for Swansea there by Purcell. To Peter Davis, to Eddie Thomas, they're inside, Swansea's inside right, to Peter Davis, tackled by Baker, and it's Mel Charles there, heading with Hughes, going forward, oh, what a great ball play here by Mel Charles, look at this, he's got a great chance, he shoots, and he's there! A great goal, they've never come any better than that, good ball control, head control, and then just picks his shot and fires a corker of a shot into the net, so it's Cardiff 3, Swansea Town 1. And Harry Griffiths intercepts for Swansea, puts it forward again to the head of Rankmore. And now it's Colin Webster, a chip forward to Williams. Herbie Williams shoots! Oh, the beautiful goal! That's a great goal. Herbie, Herbie Williams there uh, caught it beautifully. High roll church. Oh, he's just taking his shot up then, but he likes to go through the Macintosh. Shoots! Oh, he's there! A great shot by McIntosh. I think the Swansea team were rather surprised that Alchurch didn't take it, but he almost did it up, and then McIntosh lit fire there with a great ground shot, which Dwyer had no chance, and so it's Cardiff 4, Swansea Town 2. Cardiff putting the ball into the space and then going into the return pass to Bill, keeping possession now, notice. To Charles, a flick to Hooper, Hooper shoots, and it's there! There's number five, there's number five. The 63-64 season saw another great name arrive. John Charles signing for £25,000 from his Italian club Roma. Charles, who the club had tried to sign ten years earlier, introduced himself to the crowd by scoring a 75-yard goal against Norwich City. George Swindon, who had taken over as manager from Bill Jones, suffered the same fate of dismissal when he was sacked in May 1964. He was succeeded by the former Portsmouth, Newcastle and Scotland wing half, Jimmy Schooler. Cardiff, having beaten Bangor City in the Welsh Cup, were to play in Europe for the first time. Their opponents in the first round of the European Cup Winners' Cup in 1964-65 were the Danish side, Esbjerg. With the first leg in Denmark ending goalless, they returned to Ninian Park with high hopes. Williams now on out to Farrell. Farrell across King. And it's in the net. There's the first one. 11 minutes gone then in the second half, and it's Cardiff that deserved to go. Peter King's goal was enough to put City through to the next round, where they met the holders, Sporting Lisbon. We went to Sporting Lisbon in the um, European Cup. We had no chance on paper. But um, I think we defended for 89 minutes. Um, we had two shots of goals. Greg Faddle scored one, and I was fortunate to score the other one. And we beat him 2-1 in Portugal. That victory over Sporting Lisbon was one of the most sensational achievements in the history of the Cup Winners' Cup. Cardiff were a lowly second division side, sporting with the cup holders and one of the giants of Europe and they were stunned when Greg Farrell scored for City after just over half an hour. There was an even greater shock for them midway through the second half. Derek Tapscott's speculative effort completely deceived goalkeeper Cavallio to put City two up. No wonder Tapscott and his colleagues could scarcely believe it. The former Welsh international by this time nearing the end of his career, but still a danger to opposing defences. Sporting's almost constant pressure inevitably paid off. Figueredo scoring nine minutes from time, but City held on for an historic result. In my goal, it was one of those games I was on the right wing. Um, I turned round from a ball from the defence. I could see this big six foot something centre back coming at me. And I seen Bernard Lewis coming down the left wing. And I hit a great ball, which the goalkeeper. Um, 
misjudged and um, helped in the back of the net. I'd never known anything like it. When we got back at Roos Airport, there was thousands and thousands of people there cheering us on. After holding Lisbon to a nil-nil draw in Cardiff in the return game, the quarter-final opponents were the Spanish club, Real Zaragoza. We drew two each out there, and we lost 1-0 on an icy pitch at Ninian Park, which I think, with a bit of luck, we could have gone and played. It was West Ham in the final that same year when West Ham won the cup. We could have been at Wembley. Cardiff went on to lift the Welsh Cup for the second year running by beating Wrexham. In the first leg at Ninian Park, Wrexham were thrashed 5-0, but went on to win their home game 1-0. Because of the point system adopted by the Welsh FA for the Welsh Cup final, it had to go to a playoff, and European football was finally assured by Cardiff winning that playoff at Shrewsbury 3-0. Following the excitement of their European exploits, the next season, Cardiff were brought back down to earth with the constant fight against relegation from Division Two. But better performances were witnessed in the League Cup. Reading were beaten 5-1 at Cardiff, including a hat-trick from teenage sensation George Johnston. Another teenager to make his mark during that season was 16-year-old John Toshak, who scored on his debut against Leighton Orient. Houston, to King, a good one, Andrews there, and header almost, but yes, Johnson it is, and it is, as Johnson's third goal, and makes a score now, Cardiff 4, Reading 0. Cardiff have fallen away a little bit, they had the game completely sewn up, they've played a little bit overconfident, and I suppose it's natural if you have a lead of three goals up, but here could well be number five, and it's Andrews going forward, and Harkin shoots! It's there! There we are, number five, scored by Terry Harkin. Cardiff narrowly missed relegation once again, finishing the 1966-67 season in 20th position. The highlight of the season was in the FA Cup fourth round against Manchester City. 37,000 spectators watched the battle that unfolded on the mud-bound Ninian Park pitch. An own goal by Graham Coldrick putting the visitors ahead, but Bluebird skipper Gareth Williams pulling one back to level the score. It finished one all with Cardiff going on to lose the replay at Main Road 3-1. The 67-68 campaign was dominated by Cardiff's European challenge. It began with a visit to Dublin to meet Shamrock Rovers, resulting in a 1-1 draw. In the second leg, played at Ninian Park, Bobby Brown and Toshak finished the job with the Bluebirds winning 3-1 on aggregate. Yes, 2-0, Cardiff Lee. In the next round, City travelled to Holland to meet NAC Breeder. Again, Peter King scoring the away goal for another 1-1 draw. At Ninian Park, the 16,000-strong crowd were treated to a fine display, with Brown, Barry Jones, Toshak and Malcolm Clark scoring to bring a 4-1 result. The quarter-final against Moscow Torpedo proved a hard-fought affair, and with the aggregate score level 1-1, the match was decided with a playoff at Augsburg in Germany. Norman Dean scored to give Cardiff a semi-final place against Hamburg. With the first leg in Hamburg finishing 1-1, Cardiff started their home leg with a great opportunity of progressing to the final, and it proved to be one of the most memorable nights in their history.
Walker. And the goal, no, another great play by Urcha from D. What a goalkeeper, this fellow. And of course, Urcha is, and there's D, who could easily have had a hat trick in this first half. Humbug still dangerous when they come away on the break. Very quick on the counter attack. Do a balloon to Sailor. He scores! What a goal! Oh, what a great goal by Sailor. And Ove Sailor leads the big for free kick. Oh, if only they get off because this is when a game could be abandoned. Brian Harris, the Cardiff skipper, has equalized. Everybody forward. If you get the ball, everybody back if you lose it. This is Hoodie for Hamburg. Got Taylor on his right. Oh, he comes to the right. It's a goal. It's a goal. It is a goal, and Hamburg have won it. Hamburg have won it. It is a goal. One and a half minutes of injury time. The number 10, Hoedig, has scored. And is that a gruel of blowing football for that? The last kick of the match. And it's all over. Hamburg are through to the final. What a blow to Cardiff. It was at this time that a formidable partnership was developing between Brian Clark and John Toshak earning them the nickname the Terrible Twins. Former Cardiff City Idol and Welsh international fullback Ron Stitfall recalls Toshak as an up-and-coming youngster in his youth side. At the end of my career, I used to train the young lads uh, on a Tuesday and Thursday evening. Uh, Schoolboys, usually Cardiff schoolboys that uh, had potential, used to come and, and, and I would give a hand with the training. And, and one of them um, was John Toshak. And, and, and even at that very early age, you could see that he, he was something special. I came into the side and uh, was playing alongside a young lad called John Toshak, who hadn't played many games. And uh, right from day one, uh, we seemed to hit it off. If the ball came from the left, um, it, was, it was sort of his ball to go for. If the ball came from the right, it was me. And uh, we scored a lot of goals between us, and I enjoyed playing with him. It was great to play with Tosh because obviously he's still in football and very, been very, very successful. And I like to think that uh, in his early days, I was uh, part of his success, although a very, very small part. An improvement in form in the 1968-69 season saw City reach their highest position in Division Two since they were relegated in 1962, finishing the season in fifth place. Top scorer John Toshak scored 22 goals. Ronnie Bird, number 11. A deft, dexterous bit of play. And Ronnie Bird, number 11, with a fine effort. Carver. A good ball to Clark. Clark in here with a chance. And it's there. Yes, it's there. Wing half Sutton and the Cardiff crowd stirring it a little bit to Barry Jones. A chance here and it's there! A lovely header by Toshak, number 10. A superb header, an indicative, I think, of the caps that this man is going to get for Wales in the future. A beautiful soaring climb by number 10, John Toshak, and Cardiff lead by three goals to nil. 
Jones with the corner. And it's there! It's there! John Toshek! And one or two of the little boys coming on. Beautiful control. Reversing in field to Clark. And there it is. Number eight, Brian Clark. And I've never seen such excitement on a football field for a long time. All the lads and lasses are on there now. The nap hand for Cardiff. Cardiff were once again unlucky not to return to First Division football in 1969-70, following another successful season in which they finished in seventh place. During that season, they claimed seven successive league victories, the best sequence since 1946-47. Brian Clark was top scorer with 18 goals, just one more than Toshak, both men scoring twice in the league match against Hull City, who went down 6-0. Clark on to Toshak, and that's the goal one in the afternoon. And there's the terrible twins as they must be coming down in second division football. Clark and Toshak, Toshak the scorer, controlled it beautifully with his left foot, and there's the score. Cardiff City 3, Hull City 0. Toshak and nodded clear by Pettit. Oh, this could be the fourth. Alan, oh, and a magnificent, what a magnificent piece of football. Clark the scorer, Alan who assisted so admirably, and I'm sure they're going to have a word with Carver. And that's another one by Koshak. Oh, that's a bad mistake by McKechnie, the goalkeeper, and then I Koshak to get his second goal and the sixth. So they've doubled the score now to what it was the last time. The following season, in a bid to gain First Division status, Jimmy Schooler paid a record £35,000 for Coventry City's midfield player, Ian Gibson. In the same season, Toshak left the club, signing off with a hat-trick against Hull City. Liverpool had come in with an offer of £110,000. Bill Shankly was later to comment that he would have been cheap at a million. for Toshak. Toshak! Oh, what a goal! What a marvellous goal! John Toshak's hat-trick. And what a beauty it was. Well, we've seen some goals at Cardiff in the last month. And that took some beating. Cardiff were looking well placed for promotion when they beat Blackburn Rovers 4-1. It had been a run of seven games without defeat. City remained amongst the promotion places until they lost 1-0 at home to Watford in April. Their run of misfortune continued and they went on to win only two of their last five matches. To finish the season in third position, only the top two went up. On September the 16th, 1970, Cardiff amassed their highest win in European competition, beating the Cypriot side P.O. Larnaca 8-0 at Ninian Park. Amongst the scorers was the reliable Mel Sutton, one of the unsung heroes from City's good years of the late 60s and early 70s. And there was one from Bobby Woodruff, a skillful midfielder signed from Crystal Palace in November 1969.
In the next round, French team FC Nantes suffered a similar fate when they went down 5-1. Woodruff's massive throw-ins were a feature of City's attacks in those days. Ian Gibson didn't score many goals for the Bluebirds, but he certainly made sure on this occasion. The quarter-final brought a much sought-after encounter when, on the 10th of March, Real Madrid came to Ninian Park. Toshak had by now left for Anfield, and the revamped lineup included 17-year-old winger Nigel Rees. We were lucky enough to be drawn against them, first leg at uh, Ninian Park. Everybody looked forward to it. Wonderful atmosphere here. Had to get to Ninian Park early in the afternoon, four o'clock to miss all the traffic, 50,000 people. And uh, we went out. Uh, first half, we kicked into the Canton end. And a uh, wonderful build-up. In fact, it was this end that I scored the goal. Uh, good build-up, Bobby Woodruff, Gary Bell involved, deep in our own half on the left-hand side. Out to Nigel Rees, who wasn't a regular in the side at the time, but was selected for the game in front of Ronnie Bird. And he played. Good ball down the wing. And the ball was knocked in with Nigel's left foot. I don't think he could use his right foot, but he knocked it in with his left foot. And I was lucky enough to pinch a yard on the centre half and uh, score with a goal I should never, ever forget into the uh, left-hand side of the goalkeeper. Carver in the nick of time. Ryan Clark and Zoko forced to pass back to Borja. Number six, Bo uh, Zoko. Good play by Woodruff. Good ball to Reese. Reese crowded up by getting away with it. This is dangerous. Clark! Yes! Ryan Clark! I'm absolutely deafened by this huge crowd. Cardiff City in the lead by one goal to nil, the smaller Brian Clark. But the goal made by Nigel Rees, and what a goal it was. What a perfect goal by Brian Clark. The start of it, Woodruff to Nigel Rees, and that great header. Wonderful, wonderful night. I don't think I went to sleep that night. Couldn't wait for the early morning papers and a really wonderful couple of days. In fact, I think we went to Blackburn the following Saturday and uh, they gave us a wonderful reception. We ran out onto the pitch because they couldn't take it away from us. We were the side that beat Real Madrid in the European Cup Winners' Cup, first leg, quarter final. Second leg, we went back to, uh, to the Bernabeu Stadium in uh, Madrid two weeks later. Um, Wonderful reception when we got to the airport. Uh, they took photographs, obviously, and made us feel very, very welcome. Stopped in a very nice hotel. Um, went to the stadium on the Tuesday in train. Jimmy Schooler put us through a big trainer session on the Tuesday, much to the amazement of the uh, Spanish supporters and players who were watching. And we went out and uh, nil-nil half-time. Peter King might have pinched one. They marked us very tight over there. But unfortunately, second half, they scored two goals. So the dream was over, but they couldn't take away the victory at Ninian Park, which, as far as I'm concerned, will always remember, well, remain with me as, as the highlight of my sort of professional career. So, Cardiff had their first penalty shootout experience when they lost to Dynamo Berlin the following season, both teams unable to settle the matter after two 1-1 draws. And this is a test of a professional. Oh! Of all people, the captain of the side. And needless to say, if Dynamo convert all their penalties, Cardiff are out. And it's all on this penalty kick, whether the Cardiff go through or stay out of the competition. It's in, Dynamo are through. Don Murray put one over the top of the Grangetown end. Um, at least he was brave enough to put his hand up and say, I'll take the penalty, Jim. 
how, in, in the extra time. So, so OK, these things happen. Nine times out of ten, he would have scored. After three years of near promotion, it was relegation that City strived to avoid in the 71-72 campaign. They finished 19th in the league. The highlight of that season was a fifth-round FA Cup tie with Leeds United. 50,000 turned up at Ninian Park for the match, but despite a brave challenge by City, Leeds eventually won 2-0. Don Ravi's side were at the height of their powers and it was Peter Lorimer's corner which set up the first of both goals from Johnny Giles in their 2-0 win. Once again, it was relegation that nearly visited Cardiff in the 1972-73 season with only 43 league goals, the lowest since 1929. A relegation dogfight was witnessed in April when Huddersfield Town visited Ninian Park, City the eventual winners by four goals to one. In those days of struggle, there was no one more committed to City's cause than number two Phil Dwyer, who went on to make a record number of appearances for the club. But all too often there was action at the wrong end, and as far as City's fans were concerned, the club was constantly near the relegation zone. There was, though, the talent of winger Willie Anderson, whose skillful play provided a ray of hope for the long-suffering Ninian Park faithful, and there were finishers like Gil Reese, signed from Sheffield United in October 1972, but who'd originally been released by the Bluebirds in the early 60s. Big Andy McCulloch from Queen's Park Rangers was another deadly finisher, but not often enough to keep City away from the danger end of the table, though the Anderson-Reese combination continued to cause opponents problems. November the 9th, 1973, Jimmy Schooler was sacked after nine years of service. His replacement, former Leicester City and Manchester United manager Frank O'Farrell, lasted just six months before leaving relegation struggling Bluebirds for the Middle East. Jimmy Andrews filled a hot seat as they entered their final game of the season and they gained a point against Crystal Palace to avoid the drop. The following season, City finished 21st and were back in the third division for the first time since 1947, having scored only 36 league goals. Their visit to Division 3 was only temporary. The Bluebirds were immediately promoted, only to fight further relegation battles in the next two years. City fared better in the FA Cup when on January the 8th, 1977, they claimed a famous victory over Tottenham Hotspur. In the fourth round, they met old rivals Wrexham in one of the most exciting matches staged at Ninian Park. The final result was 3-2, with the decider scored in injury time. Only his first full senior game in the cup tie against Spurs. Roberts intercepts, but a bad back pass to save. For the fifth round, Ninian Park was again the venue for the visit of Everton. But following a bright start, when City took the lead after ten minutes, Everton struck back twice to win. After a six-week layoff due to bad weather in the winter of 1979, Cardiff, who seemed relegation-bound, turned their fortunes around to finish in ninth place. It was their highest position since 1971. The 1980s proved to be the most inconsistent decade in the club's history, with seven managers supervising four relegations and two promotions. 
The first of these managers was long-serving club man Richie Morgan, who took over to become the youngest boss in the club's history at the age of 34. The visit of first division-bound Swansea City, managed by ex-Bluebird star John Toshak, provided the highlight for City of the 80-81 campaign. With only five minutes remaining, City were trailing 3-1 until Peter Kitchen pulled one back. Then in injury time, a free kick awarded to Cardiff resulted in one of the best goals to be scored at Ninian Park, a 40-yard shot from John Buchanan that was still accelerating as it entered the net. During the 1981-82 season, Cardiff found themselves with three different managers. As Richie Morgan was replaced by Graham Williams, who'd come in as the team coach, this despite the fact that City were in the top section of the division. The following month saw the start of an 11-match run without a single victory. Glenn Ashurst was then brought in to salvage the situation, but he was unable to stop the slide into the third division. With little money available for new signings, Ashurst looked to the free transfer market. Players to arrive at Cardiff included forward Jeff Hemmerman, midfielder David Tong, fullback Paul Bodin, goalkeeper Martin Thomas, and utility player Roger Gibbons. The new city lineup performed well, and on New Year's Day they beat Bristol Rovers 3-1 to start a run of six games without defeat. A win in the last home game against Orient would ensure promotion, and over 11,000 fans watched them do it in style. Having a chance, the Hatton surely. A bit slow, but a chance still on for Dave Bennett. Lewis! What a beautiful goal, finally. Silkman to take the free kick. Mullen, pass McNeil, chance of a Cardiff break, Heberman. David Bennett is square, if you can see him. Well, he's got it, a chance for Cardiff. Oh! Put away beautifully. That's the end of it all. Cardiff are in the second division. 2 0 winners. Glenn Ashes, the sunglasses, applauding the team. And this is what the crowd think of it all. It really is quite mad. Scenes of great joy. The team, Mark, we can't really see the players. I don't know if they'll ever get off the field. 2-0 was the final score, and the relief and excitement was plain to see as the City players returned to their dressing room, second division players again after just one season in the third. With thousands of fans calling for their team on the Ninian Park pitch, the players, plus manager Len Ashurst and coach Jimmy Goodfellow, went into the director's box to acknowledge the ovation. The lads have worked hard over 46 games, and this is the culmination of a lot of work. But uh, I think it's a day for everybody, the spectators in particular. They've had uh, a lot of problems in the last four years, struggling against relegation, then eventually we went down last season. But we've come up with a little bit of style, I think, overall. Team management and financial affairs were foremost in the 83-84 season, with Len Ashurst eventually leaving to join Sunderland and the announcement that City's overall debt was £1.4 million. As a result, new manager Jimmy Goodfellow was advised that new talent could not be bought and promising young players would have to be sold. City finished 15th in a season which saw Toshak bring recently relegated Swansea back to Ninian Park for an exciting encounter. The two seasons that followed saw Cardiff plummet into the fourth division. Attendances reached an all-time low and managers came and went. The control of the club was also changed when Kenton Utilities sold out to city director Tony Clemo. Desperate to lift their flagging fortunes and raise gates, which had seen the lowest home attendances ever, at the end of the 1986-87 season, manager Frank Burrows looked for new blood in the transfer market. His meagre cash resources expanded when Watford came in to buy goalkeeper Mel Rees for £100,000. Amongst the newcomers were midfielder Mark Kelly, defender Nigel Stevenson, 
winger Brian McDermott and striker Jimmy Gilligan. The new lineup proved a useful squad, and although attendance figures were low at the start of the season, new confidence emerged as the results proved more positive. By November, crowds had started to increase, and it was this win over Exeter that put City into the top two positions in the fourth division for the first time that season. The £17,500 paid to Lincoln for Gilligan was looking one of the best bargains of the season, and he was becoming a regular scorer. The last home game of the 1987-88 season was the decisive one, with City beating Crew Alexandra 2-0 to secure promotion to the third division. Watched by a crowd of 10,000, the team had brought a much-needed lift to both themselves and the supporters. Another bargain was the speedy Kevin Bartlett, signed from non-league Ferrum the previous year. He was to score some vital goals in City's promotion success. Mike Ford had by now established himself as a strong midfield player, and the experience of ex-Arsenal man Brian McDermott gave City an added dimension. It was McDermott who scored the goal which settled promotion on May the 2nd, 1988, with City going up in second place. After four years of constant struggle on the field, it wasn't surprising that the fans were so delighted at having something to celebrate at long last. With a good side built from modest signings and free transfers, surely now City could go on to better things. The spirit's been great this season. Uh, we was, I think we got what we deserved last year. But this year, I think the lads have stuck together. We showed a lot of commitments, and the just rewards are today. You've done it on a small squad as well. Yeah, you know, uh, fair dues to, you know, to the boys. They played with injuries. They battled well. You know, um, what more can I say? You know, as you said, like you've got a senior squad of 16 players, and uh, everybody's played their part. City remained in the third division just two seasons before being relegated back to the fourth. In 1991, local businessman Rick Wright emerged as a financial benefactor willing to wipe out City's immediate debts and pay the wages of new recruits. Following the departure of Len Ashurst, first team affairs were put in control of team coach Eddie May. The 1992-93 season brought new hope to the flagging fortunes of the Bluebirds, with the signing of new players into the squad and the development of some of City's promising younger talent, Cardiff soon progressed up the third division table. And with the steadying influence of the former Everton Wales captain Kevin Ratcliffe at the back, the foundations were laid for both promotion and the championship. The club practically clinched the title in their final home game of the season by beating Shrewsbury Town, before sealing it at Scunthorpe a week later. Following victory over Wrexham in the Welsh Cup semi-final, the Bluebirds overwhelmed Rill at the National Stadium to win the trophy and guarantee a place in Europe. In the summer of 1993, Rick Wright made headline news with the unprecedented move of giving the club away to the 8,500 members of the Junior Bluebirds. Only time will tell if the club can go on to further success. Football started off with the people getting together to form a team and then watch the team. And I really think that, in some respects, football's gone too far away from its roots. And I think anything, I think that Cardiff City is going back to its roots, that the club is now owned by the supporters, uh, who are, in fact, the, the lifeblood of any football club. <laughs>